The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus calls us to save and follow him. And promise that if we do, we shall be with him. Come, be with him now. Save him, follow him, and give glory to God. Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. And we want to thank you for uh, giving your time to the word of God. Um, it really helps you to grow spiritually when you give your time to listen to the word of God. Um, you have the hunger to say, I need more of it. So God bless you as you continue to listen to this message. Let us pray. The hour has come to let go of the case and worries of the week that has passed and to set aside the hopes, expectations we have for the week to come. The hour has come to stop in the midst of every day and to focus on this day and this moment, a time to consider life beyond ourselves. Let us give this hour back to God let us give time to God. Today, in this place, we want to see Jesus. We knew what it wants to be human. Jesus draw us in and open us up. Open our eyes to see you, our hearts to share with you. Open our mouths to share with one another and all that we know of you. Amen. I would ask the brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God from the two books, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and the book of John chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. Good morning, everyone, and God bless. It's a wonderful day today to be able to read the word of the Lord to all you guys. I uh, hope you're getting into the word yourself. and. Uh, going back over Johnson's old YouTubes and checking them out, especially those ones you've missed, and uh, just uh, getting into the Word. It's, it's great to be a, a son of God and a daughter of God, I'm sure. Uh, so as Johnson mentioned, it's the reading this week's from Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 to 34 for starters. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. So the second verse this week is from John 12, 20 to 36. Now there were some Greeks amongst those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. People went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, with anyone, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, The voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out and I will be lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this is to show the kind of death he, he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. 
We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the darkness does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. And this is the word of the Lord, and uh, what an amazing passage. Where all the people heard the, the voice of God. So we'll get Johnson back, and uh, can't wait to hear his message this week. It's going to be a, another really good one. So come with open ears. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, this morning I've decided to share with you on the theme, we would like to see Jesus. We would like to see Jesus. Say, we wish to see Jesus. This was the request of the Greeks who had come to worship at a festival in Jerusalem. These were Gentiles, non-Jews, who likely showed up at the Jewish Passover and other festivals because they intuitively felt that the God of Israel was the true God. Their own philosophies and religious systems must not have been satisfying to them for it seems they knew that there was more to be found. It appears that they felt that Israel desired to discover answers to their deepest questions. Say, we wish to see Jesus. I wonder if they were nervous about their potential encounter with him. Did they have questions for him? When they met him, did they blot out something embarrassing? If they had been cell phones or mobile phones in Jesus' day, would they have asked to have a self with him? Say, we want to see Jesus. They spoke to Philip, one of only two disciples with a Greek name. Perhaps they knew him from their past. Maybe they just said that he wouldn't dismiss their request just because of their cultural background. Perhaps he was the one disciple who could understand their language. Whatever the reason it was to Philip that they said, say, we want to see Jesus. It appears that Philip wasn't sure what to do with the request. They didn't seem to be a set of rules or a precedent of how to deal with Gentiles in their disciples' training manual. So Philip consulted Andrew, the other disciple with a Greek name, and together they went and told of Jesus of the Gentiles' request. Jesus' response on the surface may appear a bit odd to us. This was Jesus' response. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. This was Jesus' words. So throughout the Gospel of John, at various critical points of Jesus' ministry, when the crowds are either very upset and with his teachings and are ready to kill him, or are even very impressed with his miraculous powers and ready to crown him, King, he says repeatedly, my hour has not yet come. But at this moment he's saying, my hour has come. But here in today's reading, after this apparent innocent request by Greek visitors, he announces that the hour has come, that the glory they have been longing for was now to be revealed. Not in weak wrecking visions and, or, or for his enemies, or in doing even greater miracles, but by his falling into the earth and dying as a grain of wheat, in his losing his life, and by being lifted up on the cross, that is what it is. So perhaps we we may wonder how Philip and Andrew responded to the words of Jesus. We know that no amount of explanation by Jesus to his disciples that he must be lifted up on the cross, be crucified, and die even seemed to get through to them. They simply could not embrace or receive that revelation. Yet Jesus pressed on with this, his messianic actions and message. But why now? Because the world was knocking at his door. The nations were clamoring for his salvation, and these Gentiles had come. And he knew that the only way they would truly see him was to guess up upon his bloody glory 
lifted up from the earth on the cross where he would draw all people to himself. Say, we wish to see Jesus. What is it that is so transforming? So powerful healing about gazing upon a crucified Lord. What is it that draws us back here again and again as we walk through the somber days of Lent and do the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ? Every Sunday people are coming to church. What is it that is drawing us? When I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. That is what Jesus says. Perhaps Jesus was saying to Philip and Andrew and to the Greek visitors and to us that it is time to gaze upon him in awe and wonder as we allow our hearts to be drawn by his transforming love which calls forth a loving response from us. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord. For I shall all know me. Jeremiah 31, 31, 34. So the dichotomy of which Jeremiah spoke between the old and the new covenant was not a setting of the law. Over against grace. The God of the New Testament over against the God in Jesus Christ. Nor was it a setting of Judaism over Christianity. So God's activity among his people has always been grace-filled and the content of the covenant remains the same. People are called into a loving relationship with their creator, which they respond by keeping his law. So it is the means of keeping that covenant which Jeremiah prophetically saw could, would be transformed. No longer would the law be written on stone tablets, but on the heart. So there is a change now from the stone tablet to the heart. No longer would there be a need of intermediaries each one would have the Lord for himself or herself. You are able to go to the Lord yourself. You don't need someone. But it is, that is very scary transformation to imagine. To have a surgery done upon one's heart. To have to face God on one-to-one -one intimate level as an awesome proposition. It is much easier to view God's law as something on a stone. Something out there. Some ideal that we all strive for, but never quite make. Or even demand which seems a bit unreasonable. So it is much safer to live with a religious system than to enter into a relationship with the living God. For that is the sword which Jesus brought. It was not what he said. It was who he was. There was something about the very person of Jesus himself that he fascinated people of every generation over the 20 centuries since he first caused such a commotion in that little region of Galilee. That is why those words first spoken by some Greeks to the disciples, Philip, are so important to men and women and young people and boys and girls today. Say, we would like to see Jesus. This is the most sincere desire for us. We want to see Jesus. When we come to church, we want to see Jesus. We want to experience him for ourselves. A second-hand report is not enough. We long to be in his presence. We want to assure ourselves that he is real, that he is relevant, that he is resurrected. We, like Thomas, want to put our hands into his hands and feet inside. We want to know him as our savior and friend. We want to see Jesus. This is part of why we are here in worship today. We want to see Jesus. This is part of why you are listening to this message. You want to see Jesus. We haven't come to learn the latest political philosophy or to celebrate some dead theology. The hymns are lovely. The atmosphere is cordial. The prayers are reassuring. But none of it counts for anything if we cannot see Jesus. We would like to see him because something is missing in our lives. Something is missing. We had such high hopes, such great dreams, such fresh sense of Christ's presence in our lives. But time has taken its toll. There is something missing. Something is missing. We would like to see Jesus. Our lives sometimes seem tedious. So lacking in vitality if we are on a continual treadmill. Most of us think of treadmills as high-ended exercise equipment. But did you know that treadmills were originally invented as a form of punishment? 
Some of you are thinking, yeah, I can't believe that. In Victorian England, trading mills were placed in prison. Prisoners were forced to work for hours each day on a trading mill as a form of mindless, meaningless punishment. So many people suffer from such a deep sense of meaningless that their life feels like a treadmill. Constantly moving but going nowhere. Always busy but producing nothing. Something is missing in our lives, brothers and sisters. Some of us are life tired. I think a lot of us can relate to the idea of being life tired. They are always tired and they don't know what is the problem. They don't even know. It conveys the idea of just scaring sadness all the time like a burden you can't put down. A sensation of great spiritual anguish often without any specific cause. Something is missing in our lives. And if there's nothing we can do, nothing we can buy, no every subject that we can feel that sense of longing, we would like to see Jesus. That's why we come. We would like to see him because some of us have never experienced the peace uh, that Christ brings. We need something to give our lives not only meaning but also new vitality. We are empty. We are bored. I'm talking to my children. Always sometimes you hear the word, I'm bored. Meaning that there's nothing in their life. And because we are empty and bored, we have no vitality, no zest, no drive. There is an energy crisis in our lives. It has nothing to do with oil or nuclear powers. It has to do with us. Something is missing within us. It has to do with that inner emptiness. We are tired, listless, and apathetic. What we need is a new heart. Not a donated or a man-made heart. But the heart that Jeremiah spoke of, a, a heart that only seeing Jesus can give. A heart that only Jesus. He is saying, I, in a second says, I have to replace this stony heart with a new spiritual heart. So this is what we are longing for. It is this heart filled to our crucified Lord that Jeremiah spoke of hundreds of years before. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord for they shall know me. This is what Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 said. There's a guy called William Gibson wrote the book of Mass for the Dead to honor his parents and their devotion to their children. In the book, Gibson tells how he grieved his mother and wanted badly so to understand the secret of their faith, which strengthened her in life and gave her peace and courage to face her death. So he took his mother's bloomed, rimmed glasses and faded prayer book, so set in a favorite chair. He opened the prayer book because he wanted to hear what he had said. He put on her glasses because she wanted to see what she had seen. She sat on her prayer, her place of prayer and devotion because he wanted to feel what she had felt. He wanted to experience what he had so deeply centered and empowered her. Nothing happened though. It did not work. That is not too surprising. He needed a faith of his own, not his mother's faith. You don't need someone's faith. You need the faith of your own. So William Gibson needed to see Jesus. That's what he was missing. It wasn't the chair or the prayer book or the glasses that shaped his mother's character or brought her such peace. It was a relationship with Jesus. So Gibson mother saw Jesus. That truth shone from her life in such a way that it caused her son to crave that same experience. That's what all of us need. To see Jesus and to know Jesus that is real and that is with us in his trials and tumult. Is Jesus real to your life? Do you experience Jesus in your personal life? Is it you are living in emptiness of life where you, you don't even know that you are going or coming back? You don't know your situation. Pastor John Joel tells of a man named Charles who was lying in a hospital bed near death. Anyone who knew Charles would tell you he was not a nice man. He drank too much. He treated his wife and children badly. So the nursing staff was a little surprised when Charles asked for a chaplain to say, I want to see a chaplain. So Charles asked the chaplain to pray for him. What did you want me to say to God? The chaplain asked it. Tell God I'm sorry for the way my life is turned out. 
child said. Tell him that I'm sorry for the way I treated my wife and kids and that I have always loved them. Sure, I can do that, the chaplain said. Is there anything else? Charles hesitated. Tell God that I know I have no right to ask this, but I would like to be able to live with him. And the chaplain bowed his head and prayed and told God everything that Charles had said. The next morning when he came to visit, the nursing staff told him that Charles had passed away in the night. Charles nearly missed seeing Jesus. But it's never too late if that is the desire of a person's heart. He made it at the last minute. There is another person who did it, who was on the cross with Jesus, who was also a thief. Lord, remember me in the kingdom of God. Remember me. It's time for you to ask God to remember you while it's just you alive. Jesus came to show us that the one day we can live with God and we don't have to deserve it. Before the creation of the world, God planned to give his life on the cross to guarantee it. No matter how much of a disaster our lives may seem to be, there is one who offers much grace, more peace, more love than we would ever exhaust in a million lifetimes. Say, would like to see Jesus. This is our call. So we want to see Jesus that we may obtain new meaning, new vitality, new possibilities, and the blessed assurance that we never alone. That is what we are looking for. We want to see Jesus. In conclusion, my friends, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No wonder we are long to see him and we can see him. Through the eyes of faith, we can per perceive him in our minds. He is here. He is available to us today. He is the person why we are here. We want to see Jesus. To all who receive him, he's here. Let us take new hope, new courage. Let us commit ourselves anew to his work. For we have beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten son of the father. And he is Jesus Christ. As someone is so beautiful said, Christianity is not a philosophy. Jesus came to teach. Christianity is not a philosophy Jesus came to teach. It is a life Jesus came to impart. Won't you receive the life that he has to give you today? Won't you receive the life that Christ is calling for you? Wherever you are, I don't know your situation, but I'm saying I'm calling for you to say, won't you give your life to Christ? And you, your life will never be the same. Your life will never be the same when you give your life to Christ. He is the only one who can help you in your situation. When things are not going on well, give your life to Christ. Surrender everything to Christ and you will be in control. You will be in charge of your life. May the good Lord bless you as you put your life to Christ. If you put your life into Christ's hands so that you can take control of your life. God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Eternal God, your prophet proclaimed the days would come when your covenant love would be written on our hearts. For the days that are here, the days are past. We worship and adore you. Our oh God, because the place within our hearts, the covenant love of mighty God, gracious Father, Lord, Lord of King of Kings, as we reflect our lives before you, we can trace your promised presence, prompting presence and protecting presence. It is because of this that we know your faithfulness, mercy, grace, and life. We give you thanks for these things, and yet our God, our thanksgiving is not just for what we have received in the past, but because we know you are present with us today and will be into the future when we are finally welcomed into your eternal kingdom with Christ our Lord. Amen. It's time for us to give our offerings. You would see the account details on the screen. Please, uh, we ask you just to give generously because of what God has done in your life. If you have found favor with God through this message, we also ask you, we encourage you to make a response also through your giving. Let us pray for our giving. 
Father, we pray for this offering that your people are giving. It's a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for what you've done to my life. Thank you for what you are doing in my life every week, every day of my life. I want to always be thankful. So we bring our offering so that we thank it before you. We bring it in your hands. Bless it, Father, so that we continue to listen to your word. We continue to uh, love you. We continue to obey obedient Christians. So be with us, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive benediction. We go in the name of Christ. In times of joy and sorrow when all is well with us. When nothing goes right, we will follow the cross and proclaim the resurrection. We go in the name of Christ. And we also ask you to say we want to see Jesus in our lives. Thank you, Father. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>